a friend had sent me a package. I looked at it and I thought, okay, this is what you've got to do, Michelle. Michelle Feeney knows what it takes to build a cult beauty brand. She launched Creme de la Mer that Mac to become the world's biggest makeup brand and was the CEO of Saint Tropez. She's now the founder of Floral Street, a modern British sustainable fragrance brand. I want us to be a significant British brand mm. that I'm very proud of. The one thing I consistently want to strive for is better sustainability in everything we do. I launched Creme de la Mer from being a little pot of cream that nobody's heard of. It's a multi-billion dollar brand now. My time at Estee Lauder headquarters in New York in a multi-billion dollar company was like being an Olympic athlete. MAC was this lifestyle and it was all ages, all races. They stood up for their principles. Having your own company is completely different. In what way? Hello, my fellow leaders. Welcome back to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. If you're a regular here, there's a very easy way to show your support and to help us grow. Download the Fountain app on your mobile, follow Anatomy of a Leader with Maria Vorostovsky, and just start listening. You can share your thoughts on this episode by sending a boost. It's like a payment with a message. And see what other listeners have to say or create clips that you could share with others. Getting started is super easy and you can top up your Fountain wallet with your bank card. Oh, and you can also earn rewards by listening to the Fountain app too. It's seriously a no brainer. Follow the link in the show notes or visit fountain.fm to find out more. Michelle, yes. thank you so much for coming on to Anatomy of a Leader. Thank you for asking me. Nice to meet you. Yeah, good to meet you. Well, I'm going to throw a curveball question at you. Okay. <laughs> What's one thing that not many people know about you? I play the piano accordion. There okay. You go. <laughs> <laughs> when did you learn that? Or I did actually. Um, I learned it as a child actually, growing up. So I don't know if that's um, interesting enough fact, but um, mm. but yes. Um, and I also did you know Irish dancing for most of my life because I I grew up in a sort of an Irish community in the middle of England. So. Interesting. Yeah. And so was music always part of your life, or is it something that you felt drawn to? No, it was absolutely, you mm -hmm. know, um, my mum's Irish and my, my, my dad's family. So it was always, always, always part of our life and mm -hmm. part of our community mm -hmm. as well. And um, if you visited sort of Irish centres um, in, in the 70s and things, people would just bring their instruments and all sit and start playing and, and you know, playing together without mm -hmm. an agenda. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's what I turn to now, actually, is music all the time to inspire me relax me um you know if i've if i'm going somewhere and i need confidence and i'm it, it, you know i'll be listening to some aretha franklin on my on my earphones to get me you know to get me feeling powerful so i it, it's just absolutely part of who i am really mm. so w when do you choose the moments to listen to something to feel you know, powerful, as you said, is it during moments when you feel like you are struggling or is it like a proactive thing? No, it's proactive, I think. Um, for instance, I, I moved back from um, America. I had a big, you know, as you know, a big, a big, big role, global role um, in New York. And I got married at 40 and moved back to England and had my second child. And then I got offered um, a position within private equity to be the CEO of a brand called Saint Tropez, which was tanning. And it was kind of failing at that. They bought it for a lot of money. It wasn't doing as well. Um, and and the, um, the, the main base was in Nottingham. And I lived in London with my my daughter was only about one and a half actually then and so I had to travel up there uh, commute almost um, and I had a lot of difficult things to do to let go of people that I'd never done before to reshape things to try and um, get a whole new team of people working in the right direction and it was really challenging and I'd also never worked within private equity or anything before and I used to get the 6.30 a.m. train out of London and, bef and, and I would actively 
about you know be listening to the music I'd work and then about half an hour before I got off the train I'd be listening you know to probably Aretha Franklin Mm. and 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 powering myself up to be able to do that day Mm. what was it like working with private equity um great actually to be honest I think um it is look there's pros and cons to everything but I loved the discipline it brought to me as a business person. I wasn't, I'd never been a CEO before. I'd, you know, I'd had a, a very big job in a very big, we, we, you know, we built Mac, the senior management team had taken Mac to be a billion dollar company, which I played a, a, a significant role in that. But I was, a, I was in charge of a piece of that, not the whole thing. And I'd never been a CEO, so I had to, you know be and then the discipline of private equity it is about the bottom line you know and and every month you have to do a um a board meeting where you're challenged around the table um and i actually used to practice um ldc you probably didn't know this who were the who were the private equity but i used to get the board report and i'd sit opposite my husband it, on our dining table a bit like we're sitting here and I'd say okay you be the investors and and you ask me all the questions they're going to ask for this so I'd prepare myself for the questions um but what it gave me was this you know the biz the, the numbers are important even if you don't have to understand absolutely all of them because you know that's not my forte uh, but find people that do and that can help you and also, there was a very, you know, it was a highly leveraged company. We were dealing with also banks and things. So it taught me a hell of a lot about the the back end of business. It's all very well having a great idea, thinking you can have a brand. Um, but there has to be some, some basis in there of, you know, especially as you start to evolve and develop. So it taught me so, so much. And it made me a much better business person. Mm. They were tough, but mm. I was tough back. I'd have my Alexander McQueen dress on. <laughs> I, you know, you I think I was... playlist. Well, <laughs> yes, exactly. I was not yeah. the usual person they dealt with, let's put it that way. Mm. And I, I'd sort of come from high energy, you know, perf- perfection, um, you know, Estee Lauder Companies, New York, General Motors Building, you know, uh, where things were slick and tight and what I did try to bring was that into their world Mm -hmm. but I had to fight quite hard to get them to believe in what I was doing and wanted to do Um, so it made me quite a tough cookie actually Mm. I think on that on that front Mm. what else do you think what other qualities do you think made you successful at being able to get your point and your perspective across to them well I had experience so I had proof that certain things would work um I was I'm passionate about what I do I'm really really passionate and I think if you're passionate and not frightened um and you can build a case around why you're doing something and for what reason and also fight for that corner you know around the board table Mm. you know it's quite the thing about private equity is it is predominantly male run and you have to feel that you can hold your own in that room um and and i think i held my own how how did you do that believing in what i was doing Mm -hmm. um disagreeing with them but also listening to them you know listening where they had a valid point um, I used to pretend I understood some things I didn't understand. So, you know, and I, I kind of used to say I thought breach meant, you know, something to do with childbirth. But it's, it's when you breach a covenant, which means if you don't have enough money in the bank, um, they, can, they can take the company back, really. So there was, there was lots of things I learned along the way. I bluffed a little bit. Um, I practiced with my husband. Um, and I built a really, really good core team. So my whole life, the core team is the key. You know, I am the front man, but without the team, 
you you can't achieve anything mm. unless you're a you know a singular dancer or a singular sports person but even they have teams behind them mm. you know so i think it's recognizing the the importance of team and all being you know in having different qualities that you bring together so i had excellent um partners in crime and we would prepare well for what you know it's, it's almost like going into battle sometimes mm. with with a board meeting you know um but i i learned a lot um i delivered what they wanted to get delivered in the end you know they got their money back from their investment and a bit more and mm. um and i learned a lot and and i also made some money you know a chunk of money for mm. the first time in my life so it was um it was an incredible few years mm. going back to talk to building a team mm. what i have found in my experience is that women female leaders especially are really excellent at building teams and mm. i think it comes down to having self awareness and being much more aware of your own limitations and not having that ego as much mm-hmm. um and then building a team around you that supports that and being able to let go of some of the things to allow the team to to do that would you say that's what you have experienced as well yes and no i mean if you speak to my team now they'll go oh my goodness yeah i'm i'm tough i am tough yeah. right because I've experienced such a lot and the expectations of myself on myself are the hardest that I'll ever experience mm-hmm. it isn't from a boss or from a but um I think women generally are better t- they do want look there's different age groups different kinds of people now in the workplace the workplace is a different place so I I don't want to be like oh you a male female thing but um I the proof is you know there's been many studies about this isn't there really that women we won't we don't tend to say things unless we can do them or believe them um you know we won't we won't take that job you know we we talked briefly didn't we off off the podcast but you know i did get offered a a leading role in a big brand that i'd launched in america and i turned it down mm. in estee lauder companies and i think they were like nobody ever turns anything <laughs> down you know but i i had to become a single mom and i thought if i take that role heading up this brand right now i have to be 350% into that role all the time and i won't have time for my son so i chose to and they they gave me a different role which mm. took me in another fabulous direction um but i do think yes i i think look my my entire company now at floral street we we're, we're 26 25 are women um i'm quite a hard taskmaster but i do i do love a team and actually the senior team for me now have been with me since the beginning 6 mm. years um and one came straight from university and and one had had a big career in in um in Estee Lauder as well so you know that combination of those age groups and i i just love learning from the others around me as well mm before we go down you know what your brand is floral street yeah, yeah. and how you came about founding it and 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 talking mm-hmm. about that take me back in time to your Estee Lauder days because mm-hmm. um i don't know how long you were there but you said you were in new york yeah. and so you were were leading i think is it creme de la mer and mac yeah i i moved to new york in 1990 1991 and i went with my then boyfriend who was a record producer I'd given up a big job in London working at Lim Franks and uh without a plan and I met Michael Gordon who owned a salon hair salon actually called Bumble and Bumble and I went to interview him because I was doing bits of journalism and then the next day he called me and he said look would you come and talk to me and I'm thinking it's a bit strange and he said I've got a really good feeling about you and and nobody's ever done I haven't had anybody doing PR or marketing would you consider it so I went back to my apartment. I had to go and buy a typewriter and I, I I can't even type to be honest with you. But I I did this proposal and took it to him and he took me on. And anyway, that led to me building my own agency in New York at 26, 27. Wow. And um that's a whole other podcast about all my amazing <laughs> clients and what I was doing with nightclubs and music and 
And I launched um, the Bumble and Bumble hair products because I said, come on, Michael, you've got to do these products. And Estee Lauder noticed they'd asked around all the beauty editors in New York and um, they had a role. Uh, and they, they called me and said, would you come and talk to us? And 10 interviews later, can you imagine having 10 interviews? <laughs> Including Leonard Lauder himself. Um, they offered me a major role in Prescriptives, which was the hot brand in the 90s, mm. a global role. And, and I took it. Um, and that was me moving into corporate. So I was a single mom. My son was about two, just over two. Um, I had an office overlooking Central Park. And, you know, I was, what, 32 at that point, so it was really exciting. Mm. And hadn't had this um, traditional way of... I didn't apply for ever apply for a job. And it's just like doing a great job every day. Mm. And then in, in Estee Lauder in New York at that time, it was... When I joined, it was a private company, so they hadn't gone public, and they didn't have as many brands. But as I stayed there, they bought more brands and... They had this saying, good work gets rewarded with more work. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily more money all the time. But anyway, no. it was a great, it was, it was, I learned so much from the company, from working with Leonard and Evelyn Lauder, who were the family, you know, the son of the founder, Esther Lauder, about how to be, you know, how to, you, the expectations were huge on you. Um, but the professionalism, the the dynamicism. Um, so I I I went up and up and up really. Mm. Um, and then I launched Creme de la Mer from being a little pot of cream that nobody'd heard of. I think it's a multi-billion dollar brand now. I mean, it's uh, huge. Yeah. I mean, I don't think. There's uh, anyone who's not heard. Yeah. Sorry, everyone. It's really expensive as well. <laughs> Is this your fault? <laughs> Is the reason Creme de la Mer is so expensive? I did the thousand dollar jar, yeah, <laughs> um, when people were. But, um, and, then, and then Mac, you know, which was the best role I've, um, you know, had in a job sort of role, which was incredible. Mm. But even that, you know, Lorda saw that it was a, had to be treated like an independent company. Um, and I got to work for John Dempsey, who's maverick and wonderful, and the team were incredible. And um, it was my, it was, it was just like getting a PhD, basically, mm. in business and travel. I, I, I was part of launching forty countries. I mean, imagine that. It was like incredible. Yeah. yeah. Talk about the early days. What was that like? What early days? My early days or the Mac early, Mac days? early days? Well, that we we. Lauder acquired the company from the two founders, Frank and Frank, who were Canadian. Uh, they were partners in life as well. Um, and they had just built this incredible company out of Toronto, working with a lot of the models at the time who were Canadian, so Linda Evangelista. And they were taking these products on shoots all around, and, and that's how it sort of started in a way. And it sort of merged with a nightlife kind of vibe. And I had one of my clients when I had my own company was Peter Gation, who owns the Limelight. And then I launched Club USA, Palladium, the Tunnel Club. And I had this ex experience of working with celebrity and nightlife. And actually, Mac was this lifestyle. And it was all ages, all races, all Mac, before anybody was talking about gender or it was so accepting. You know, they had the Mac AIDS Fund, which had raised quite, you know, I, I think 10 million at that point from the lipstick. And, and I was able to take that and grow that and sign the talent, um, like Mary J. Blige and little Kim, Elk John, to get and, and learn about AIDS. And it was just this perfect brand that they had created that engaged everyone that worked there mm -hmm. you know and and I remember a story being told to me about when they Nordstrom is one of the biggest department store chains and um, Mac had gone in and was performing extremely well but it's they said oh we don't want all your what would be called transgender people working there now and the original owners had said, well, if you don't want our people, you don't get our brand. Mm. So they were, you know, they stood up for their principles. 
Um, they were a home to creatives around the world. We actually made being a makeup artist really a thing, yeah. you know, and, and, and I developed the fashion outreach for MAC around the world. And again, teams, amazing teams of people that we just, they're still friends now anywhere mm. I go in the world. You know, we talked about Brazil. You know, I, I can sort of pick up the phone and or email somebody now wherever I am in the world and I'll know somebody from those from those incredible MAC days. Mm. So I learned really about the power of believing in what you were doing, the power of sort of going out on a bit of a limb about what you were doing if you if you want to make some change like when we launched China with Mac you know I had to meet with officials because they didn't want to admit that there was an AIDS problem you know whereas when I go to a different country you know like India we actually ended up donating to build a hospital there so it was um it it, it had this amazing um ability to take beauty which I love and use it in a really powerful way not just in the everyday lives of an artist who at that point might have had to leave their home somewhere in the midwest to come and be who they needed to be you know themselves that gave them a home and a job and a career um, but also by buying the it was early days of really buying a lipstick and doing some good in the world mm. i'm not really seeing so much of that now really in you know there's a lot of a lot of brands saying they do things but it's like more lip service yeah i do mm. excuse the pun but yeah mm. <laughs> it, there is so i think that it was an incredible and what was brilliant about a still order companies at that time you know they understood that they didn't want to mess with that and that they wanted it to be its own, keep it as, as true to itself as it could be. So we actually ended up getting an office that wasn't in, um, you know, the main Estee Lauder buildings in New York and, and creating its whole atmosphere. So each role I've had, I've, I've just learned, you know, so much in a different way um, between working with a founder that was Michael Gordon, you know, my early early days in the 80s in London I worked for two incredible women Leslie Goring and Lynn Franks and they created their own companies in the 80, 80s and we were doing fashion show production and fashion PR and there wasn't a British fashion week until Lynn Franks founded it in the early 80s you know a lot of people young people just don't know that they yeah. think things have been around so I've always been around really dynamic people that make change and it doesn't mean that you can't be successful in business and make change. Um, you know, and even with Saint-Tropez, when I was, had that brand, I worked with the Prince's Trust about self-esteem. And, you know, the, to me, it's really important that whatever I'm doing, there is there's some payback in there, some way, shape or form. And now, you know, with, with Floral Street, how crazy am I going into the world of, fragrance and perfume as an independent company mm. but I wanted to shout about sustainability and the packaging it was it was something I'd noticed was not being taken care of so maybe now if I know what I've known would I do that I'm not sure because I'm on an early journey of this company mm. but it definitely felt like I needed to with my experience and my voice and my you know my career sort of go out and do something a little bit different mm. was there a point that you knew you wanted to create something of your own or did it just sort of come about or how did it come about I sold Saint Tropez um not me we sold Saint Tropez to Pisa Cousins and they asked me to put a beauty division together for them and that that meant merging um, sanctuary spa and products Charles Worthington, um, Saint-Tropez, and I also acquired another brand called Fudge for Hair. Uh, one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life was to merge like four different back ends of a company, four different um, cultures, and try and bring that together. Anyway, um, Sanctuary was in Covent Garden on Floral Streets, and I used to go for meetings there and things, and I looked up one day, literally, and I thought that would be a great name for a... A fragrance brand. So I actually pitched the idea to PZ Cousins mm -hmm. and I said, look, come on, let's... And we, we re registered the name globally 
and they did a P&L and they were like, oh no, this, you know, this will never work. Um, so I, when I left, I said, look, you know, you're not going to use this registration. So I, I took on the registration of Floral Street around the world. And then I took a year out at 51, had my gap year because I've been working since 15. And um, before you move on, I'm really curious about that moment in time. So you're 51, you're taking time off. What are you doing? Nothing. I've been busy all my life and also um, travelled a lot extensively. And I wanted to take myself out of beauty fashion for a year and be a mum. Mm -hmm. My kids were begging me to go back by the end. But um, be a mum, be be, be in life and see what the consumer was seeing also and consider what the next steps were. Do I want to do a brand do I want to stay in beauty do I want to you know I did get approached about being a politician by both sides Um, do I want to have a charity role you know what do I want to do and then one day when I was at home a friend had just got a new role in a in a beauty company and she sent me a package and it was in a beautiful bag with a ribbon took that off There was another bow, there was a box, there was a product inside. And I looked at it and I thought, okay, this is what you've got to do, Michelle. This is ridiculous. What are we going to do with this? Um, And I literally found a very good friend of mine and work colleague, um, sister in business, um, Selma Tertzig, found me a person to come and work on products. And we sat around my dining table and then there we, and I started, that was it. I think there's so much power in, especially when you've been working your entire career, like mm. always the next thing and being busy mm-hmm. and, you know, constant scheduled calendar mm-hmm. and not a single gap to even like consider what you're doing. Mm. And then taking completely that time off without filling your calendar back in to let things just naturally happen and to flow and I was talking to another guest who is actually in the process of doing that right now so like stepping down and being like okay let's see what life brings and I think it's amazing when all of a sudden like all of your years of experiences what you enjoy what Mm. you're passionate about all of a sudden it's like everything just connects yeah and 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 I tell you, it was hard. I used to, you're talking about, you know, the calendar and the schedule and everything. I used to sit in front of my computer sometimes in the morning and kind of go, okay. And there was nothing there. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, what are we going to... How did you feel? Like, what what, what It was hard. It was really hard. And Mm. then I I wanted to find out what the core of... It sounds a bit woo-woo, but, you know, I'd been on the go. I'd been a single mom. I'd lived in another country. I'd moved to Britain. You know, my son was now 13. I just wanted to just stay still. And not having your calendar filled was one of the hardest, hardest things. Really hard. Um, But then I sort of got into it. And, you know, (laughs) when the kids come home and they're like, what's for dinner? And I'm like, I don't know, you know. (laughs) I'm lying on the sofa. I know, I'm watching a box set or reading a book. But um, it it, it was really 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 good for me to do that and to, but also to, to to really put yourself and your industry in perspective with the world yeah you know and um and for my sins I just then got back on and started revving up and creating and it's been you know six years now um, and we're, we're global and I you know the journey's been such a learning even after all that experience you've had having your own company is completely different and in what way well it's like wearing your heart on your sleeve isn't it you know you're it's 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 yours you can't sort of say oh somebody else created this brand and I'm you know I'm known for building brands but they've already the idea is already there you know Frank and Frank had already put the the building blocks of you know Mac in place and uh, the the two partners for Saint Tropez had already sort of so I just 
my whole career I'd taken something and made it bigger and globalised it and, and, and made it relevant to popular culture each year. Um, but this is your, your, it's all yours, you know. And I, I felt having, you know, Michelle Feeney as this, you know, beauty maven, all eyes on me to do this really, really well. Mm. Um, so you feel the pressure? The pressure is tremendous. And also it's my husband's and I, you know, we've invested our money in it. So there's that pressure. Mm -hmm. So it's been different, really different. Um, and... And also, we, you know, two years in, we, the world collapsed. So uh, getting through that, surviving, being responsible for people's lives, um, people's paychecks, yeah. people's families, you know, it's all on you. Mm. And Talk to me about uh, that because, I mean, we don't really talk about much what happened during covid but that was a really stressful period of time mm -hmm. and this idea of you know you as a leader feeling scared mm. not knowing what the next day is going to mm -hmm. bring that uncertainty you know you're going through things personally yourself mm -hmm. and then your team is looking up to you to provide that stability that you know sense mm. of certainty and you having to kind of hold all of that together. What was that like for you? Well, I'd actually done it once because I lived in New York during September 11th. And it was, um, I had a team. Mm -hmm. uh, I obviously had my own son, which I had to run to school and get. And um, we had terrible uncertainty. And, you know, all the systems went down and... Uh, and, and in New York, like most people are not from there that are working there, you know, so our families weren't there and things like this. And also it happened to be fashion week. So I had all these artists in from all over the world as well. And I just had to, as a leader of this small group of people, make everybody think everything was going to be OK, mm. even though you didn't know what was going to. And I realised that kind of getting together... And listening to people's fears, but mapping out a plan, even if you didn't know that plan was going to be working by the end of that week, mm. made people feel slightly more certain about what was going on. Even though our world then had just everything we thought was safe was was gone. You know, it was yeah. wrecked. And you, but I'd learnt that it was really important as a leader to kind of not show fear in that way um but during lockdown i i sort of adopted the same approach uh, but i did show vulnerability because i did think you show vulnerability before or is it something that you decided to do more of this time, time around yeah Th yeah it was more of this time around mm. um and you know i think women are in a completely different place in business now that you know like brenny brown says you <laughs> you know you show a bit of vulnerability it's it's helpful at times mm -hmm. um but i did say look it's not easy for me either but th the way i would i kept everybody sort of together and we met every day on zoom and we you know, so it was this, we're leading, we're going somewhere. Um, Sandra, my FD, was like the rock with me. You know, we were we were meeting every day on Zoom and, and she was, you know, doing the figures to stay alive. But I think actually the second year out of COVID was harder than anything. Mm. What made it harder? I think what most people didn't realise was that you... As a leader, you've got, you know, I wasn't at home making banana bread, mm -hmm. you know, I was keeping everybody's jobs going. And, and, and there was times when I wanted to give up and say, what am I doing this for? Because if I give up now, nobody's going to say I failed because mm -hmm. it's a new company. Um, but I didn't want to do that. And you, you were still having to be the mother, you know, the cooking, the... So I think when we came... And then we had a crisis of operational crisis with you know components and prices going up and shipping so it didn't end yeah. you know everybody's going oh, isn't it great now we can go out and go to the and you were just battling again so it, it seemed like we'd been this never-ending battling mm -hmm. day to day 
to keep going. And I think I was pretty exhausted, really. Mm. Um, and only now, I think. It, and the world's changed, obviously, and still changes every day. But um, I'm hopefully never going to live through that again. But I think as a leader... A lot of people, the BBC weren't saying, oh, let's get the leaders on and see how they are coping. You know, they, were get, they were giving you banana bread recipes and, yeah. and things to do whilst you're at home. Um, and it made me really, really understand both those situations, September 11th, and, and about the responsibility of leadership um, and keeping things rolling for everybody else. Because they're really fearful because, you know, it's their job, their livelihoods. They're, you know, um, and at different ages. And, and we also had people working for us from different countries that mm. were in London um, or not home with their parents or something like that. So so you, you take on all this responsibility. And, I, you know, my husband also runs, founded and runs his own business. And he had like 4,000 people working for him. Mm. So our house was like high stress, you know. I think also the, the, the trouble was is that not only are you dealing with a crisis situation, you are also kind of not trapped inside your home, but everything happens there. So yeah. you don't have that even that mental break from like, this is home and this is work. Like everything is just like all combined. And I get when people saying, well, let's all go back into the office now. Mm -hmm. um, I have my own kind of thoughts about that but I can kind of you know I can see that side of things of just like this melting pot of everything inside your home mm. um, but you can only be in a crisis mode for so long exactly. and I think you know when you're saying that last year was also really difficult mm. it's the aftermath of all of that of keeping it together mm -hmm. you know when you're not certain but you have to make everybody else feel like at least there is some stability in you mm -hmm. as the leader that you know you are balanced, you've got things under control, even things are falling apart, like, okay, we have a plan, let's stick with a plan. And it takes its toll. And you can only keep going for so long in that kind of mentality. I think so. But you know, look, that's what makes you, you know, who you are, that's what makes you a leader. You know, I've learned so much yet again. Um, and luckily, I do a lot of, you know, yoga and and, and have a great relationship with my husband so we can talk about things. And, mm. you know, we, we, we've got a, a big enough house that it wasn't, so, you know, I wouldn't have liked to have been in a tiny flat with my husband trying to make things work. Um, and it's changed my perspective yet again about work and life. And, um, and you know, I would like an office and everybody back in, I think, because I, I feel I miss that kind of real camaraderie of the team being in. But I now also, as a modern leader, have to know that that's it's changed, mm. you know, and we and we found we've finally found our way of having the more flexible working and that might change again. Mm. Um, but I think if you can have got through COVID and survived as a company um, and an individual, but I. Um, I think it must have given you a strength. Um, what does it kill you makes you yeah, stronger? Yeah, exactly, or so, something like that, yeah. you know. Um, and, um, and, a, and a nice drink at the end of the day was really helpful. <laughs> yeah. um, when it comes to leadership, mm. what else did you learn about yourself founding your own company? I, for me personally, because of my experience, I think... I maybe initially could have been slightly different, but I, my expectations because of my background are pretty high. I, I feel like it's almost like being, you know, my my time at Estee Lauder headquarters in New York in a you know multi billion dollar company was like being a an Olympic athlete. And now I'm going down to the park to do a bit of a jog. You know, it's, it's very different. And mm -hmm. I, my expectations are really, really high. And I think as a startup, you know, you, you've got new people coming in. They haven't had your experience. You, I think it's trying to balance those two things is really hard for me. Mm. Um, because I, I want to pass on my my thinking, my ways of working, but it's not always, doesn't always want to be accepted. And, and, you know, not everybody wants to be the best they can be. 
every day. I mean, that's 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 a challenge when you've got it's your own company and you're rolling up your sleeves. But you find the people around you that have this, even though they work for big companies or or haven't had a job before, are willing. You know, a startup needs people that are willing to roll up their sleeves to do lots of jobs. And then now we're at this other stage where we're growing up slightly, you know, and we need more strategy and more organisation and more process. So that's the next challenge is to to put those things in place. Mm. But I think it's just finding the right people. And for me, I I think my expectations, I also feel I invest emotionally a little bit in people. And... um, maybe that's something I've had to kind of try and step back from a little bit mm. because people come and go, you know, and, 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 the, and the, the last three years, you would take people on in COVID who wouldn't be with you, you know, mm. six months later and the workplace has changed. So um, I, I think, think I'm finding that the hardest, actually, is getting that right. Mm-hmm. So is it to do with the fact that it's a startup? Or do you think it's to do with generations and the differences in how they approach work? I hope if my team are listening to this, you know, those that have been with me since the beginning have seen me evolve as a leader um, and maybe understand um, what different people require from the workplace. However, you know, I, I think it's this expectations because... You know, a a young student asked me to do an interview the other day and she was saying, well, what should we be looking for in a company? And I said, well, you've got to look at the size of the company and what the expectations and and be clear about what your expectations are are versus what theirs are. Um, And I think, I don't like to make generalisations, but I think because a lot of younger people have grown up with things at their fingertips and, you know, are well educated about the, you know, what their expectations are, you know, as a smaller company, you often can't meet those, you know, I would love to be doing, you know, a lot more for everybody work, works for me and, and, and being able to pay everybody a bit more and all that kind of thing. So I have to incentivize in different ways, I think. And as we grow and, and, now I've got the most amazing people that work in the company. They really are every single person, all very different. I'm very aware I need to create a career also for those people to grow. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think I'm learning every single day. I hope so. But I also can't take away from being very passionate. Can't take myself away from this in what I know and my expectations. So I guess it's finding those people that that get you as a leader as well, mm. you know. Because softly, softly, I've got children, you know, isn't isn't also life. So you know, <laughs> you, you, you you have to be pretty pretty straightforward about what you're doing. Mm. And some people just won't like my style or don't want to. I mean, half of them haven't heard of the people, the celebrities I worked with or know or, you know. Um, so I'm kind of irrelevant in lo- in lots of ways, even though they're absolutely brilliant, great things that mm. I've achieved and brilliant, fabulous people I've worked with, you know. So um, that's really interesting as well. Mm. This might be controversial, but do you think young people can't work hard or find things more challenging than, say, you know, looking back at your early days of what you had to go through Mm. and the challenges that you've had, you know, they just don't have the same kind of resilience. I think resilience is one thing, but I think they, there is the hard work ethic. There really is there. And I think it's just about being inspired. And I think it's a myth. Okay. Everybody out there, but, um, work life balance. There's points in your life when you have if you want a career if you want to get on if you want to be the best you can be there are points in your life where work is everything you know I'm not saying to anybody now who come if you make a choice that you want a balance then I don't know don't get me wrong but I I think you as an individual one as an individual 
has to make a choice in your head. What, what do I want out of my career? And if you want a career and you want to get on, you, there's times in your life when you put in your entire being to that, that role. And, and, you know, I've had to do that and, and be a mom and, and all the other things. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I think you are born with that or you, or you have it in you or you kind of don't. Mm. And I envy people that just say, I just want to do this and I want to go home and I want, you know, and I want my, because my head is constantly thinking of what, what's next, what do I do? Mm. I don't think I can undo that from my head. Mm. But I have a balanced life in, for me, I, I mean, what does balance mean? I, I, I don't know. So I don't think, I think you also have to, they have to be inspired about what they, why they want to come to you to work. Mm. I have a theory about young people because, I mean, I hear about the lack of resilience, the lack of, you know, wanting to push themselves, you know, really go that extra mile. Uh, But it tends to come from individuals who have faced hardships, Mm -hmm. who have, you know, done the difficult things, Mm -hmm. who have pushed themselves. And they only see that from their own lens Mm -hmm. so they can recognize it in other people but they see that as a rare skill Mm -hmm. and thinking back that everybody else was exactly like them when they first started but that wasn't the case either Mm -hmm. there were the people who worked hard there were the people who were motivated and there were plenty of other people who had completely different priorities Mm -hmm. but now looking at you know the the wider pool and sort of selecting Mm -hmm. people they don't it's 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 a it's a rare skill and that's the reason in my opinion why people progress and they become more successful because they are able to push themselves mm. through the pain mm. they are able to do the difficult things they do you know go the extra mile mm-hmm. um and for young people now i feel like it's slightly different because it's such an expectation to say like, stay longer hours do extra work for no extra pay, for no extra reward, and not necessarily being the you know being given the the promotions and the mm. salary raises. So I think they think, well, what's the point on doing that? Um, so I think there is a com- it's a combination of both those two things. I I think it depends what motivates you. I mean, money has never motivated me. Mm. Um, you know, I have I have it now. <laughs> I'm very happy about it. Um, And I think potentially if it would have motivated me more, I probably would have negotiated better for myself in Mm -hmm. in major roles. Um, But I I like to achieve things and I like to see my vision come to life and I like to see the people around me part of that and grow in that. And Otherwise, why would I do what I do now? You know, Mm. I'm... Everybody's younger than me at this point, you know. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm sixty. You know, everybody's younger than me. But and and I've got a nice life, and I don't have to. What if, if you if you came out and looked in on me, you'd think I was crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's something in me which motivates me. If I have an idea, I want to, I want to, achieve, I want to do it, and I want to, you know. It's been a real growth six years for me, finding out who I really am and what drives me and what motivates me. Um, and I think we've got, look, my daughter's not me, you know, she's, she's grown up in London in a, you know, pretty wealthy family and gone to private school. I didn't, I didn't do any of that. So I can't expect her to be that, to your point. I can't expect, you know, but I do feel very strongly that our education system should be inspiring everybody from every background uh, but motivating and inspiring uh, people to to grow and and and, and be better. I'm, I'm not sure I've s- necessarily seen that in in Britain now. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you know you have to see it to be it kind of thing. Yeah, is really important. How you would know? you change that? What would what do you think schools need to do? Oh God, that's no. <laughs> that's <laughs> a bottle, bottle of wine, and, and I'm, I don't know all the answers, yeah. and it's all very well sitting here and having a having a viewpoint, mm. right? So, I just think the motivational factor, really, mm. um, and I think you know, we we everybody can go to, to to college and get a degree now, but that that doesn't mean you know, there's 
you should be inspired to do other things. Yeah. You know, I, I think giving people grants to do other things, not just in those formative years, um, creates, you know, um, learn a skill. There's lots of other ways in which you can be hugely accomplished in life. And I, I, I think we need to bring that back into into our daily lives that it, mm. it you know giving opportunities in that way and also for young people to know that they can do things you know, i just went and did it all i i just went off on my own and sort of took risks and and took jobs i didn't my first job i didn't even get paid for you know and i it's a different world now I, nobody would expect somebody to do that but um you know just be a bit more free-spirited and i'm, I'm not sure I could do that in this day and age. I think what the, where I think schools are failing is in treating kids as individuals. I know some some schools are much mm. better at that, but how do you, as an individual, figure out what your strengths are, what your passions are, and you get to pursue those? Mm -hmm. So that way you get matched much better with regards to two things, your strengths and your preferences, um, as opposed to just having, I mean, it's great to have like a general understanding mm. of most things, but how do you at an early age try to figure that out so you can really pursue your strengths rather than just trying to iron out all of your weaknesses? I don't, I don't, I don't think it should be down to schools. Look, look, you know, it's parents. <laughs> if you're involved with your kids if you give them the right guidance, if you're involved in their education, if you value education, you know, the, the, don't expect a teacher to, they can inspire you, um, but my goodness now, you, you, we've got libraries with computers in, you, you, you've got sports fields, you've got, it, it's there to access, mm -hmm. but your parents have to help you know that it's up to you to access that. Mm -hmm. I feel there's a lot of blame game of, oh, it's the school, it's the teacher, it's the government, it's this, you know, we are those things. <laughs> we are the government. We are, you know, the teachers of our children or other people's children. You can inspire them with different mm. things. Go to music. When people say, oh, my kid was born, go to music. There's so much to do. You know, I've just been in um, Vietnam and Cambodia and, my God, you know, the average female worker works six days a week in a Cambodian factory, you know, for $300, six days a week. Um, and making our lovely leisure wear that we all feel empowered to do yoga in, you know, and stuff like that. And I just thought they're the future probably of the world because, you know, they want to get on, they want to work hard. So I think it's about empowering yourself, knowing yourself, as you said. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think we, we've developed into a different society, which is a good one, a very good one overall. But the blaming somebody else for you not getting on in life is not, you know. Mm. No, I, I, t I totally agree that there's a certain element of control over your own life and your kid's life. Mm. But then at the same time, you know, being a working parent, mm. there's only so much you can oh, do. Yeah. And when you're talking about, you know, there's some phases that, you know, you focus on your career, mm. but to be able to do it all and also to, you know, be a great parent, be a great wife, husband you know do great in your job start a company you know eat well exercise you know it's teach, exhausting <laughs> teach your kids i don't know violin yeah, and you know yeah, take them yeah, to yeah. football classes etc it's a lot so yeah i i do have some expectations of general society and mm. government supporting mm. uh, creating that society for which it is going to benefit for itself yeah. because if you think about it if kids work out you know where do they fit in best is it going and working for an ai company is it working within you know fragrance beauty mm. is it going and inventing something then you will have individuals who are motivated who work hard who really put themselves into that mm. thing that they have chosen rather than you know at age 40 be like, what am I doing here? Mm. You know, and have a an identity crisis or whatever, and thinking, you know, I just 
I'm in the wrong place. So I think everybody would benefit. I mean, both individually and as a society, if that was the case. But but it is all a journey. I mean, yes. you know, I, I, I didn't really have a plan. Still, I've got more of a plan now than I've ever had, I must say. But um, I, I think you, you inspire your child even by who you are in life and you having a job, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. them seeing you work hard. And, yeah. and uh, you know, our dinner table's always well they've all fled the nest now but always full of conversation about politics and you know that is your that is your play I, I you know I believe strongly in the the dinner table and the conversations mm -hmm. and you know you can fit those in yes you it's know, true you can it's it look I think women again I just think you can't we can't do it all you know we literally can't do it all mm-hmm and I think that's the biggest piece of advice I give to like other women is, you know, y y y something's got to go, but you're in control of what that is. Mm -hmm. I'm know. totally with you about yeah. your kids pay attention to what you're doing rather than what you're saying. I'll give you a good example. So, I mean, my husband's always kind of like worked out, but as a result of him... Mm -hmm. being very consistent it's making me very consistent mm -hmm. the other day in fact this weekend I wake up and I'm like someone's rustling something so I take up my phone and I take a video of my daughter rolling out the yoga mat sitting down picking up the hand weights and starting exercising her <laughs> biceps and then she's like and this is how you do it mummy and you have to do it and she's doing it like perfectly right mm. and then I go to the bathroom and my son's decided to roll out yet another yoga mat fantastic. and do squats yeah, and yesterday she tells me that at kids club she's teaching her friends burpees <laughs> So but, there you go. You've got yeah. you've got her health it will, will be forever okay, mm. and you've probably got a bit of a leader in there. I think somewhere, don't you? Indeed, with her uh, teaching Indeed. others. But yeah, I just you know I think Britain has a way of being so down and negative about everything, and we are you know we're we're not very significant in the world in general. I think we but we have a you know it, we've got it all there if you want to access it. I think. Mm. Um, in some ways. Anyway, for me, I come from not, you know, my, my mum was an immigrant into the country and her family and, f you know, they didn't even have a, have a bathroom in their house. So um, it's very, very different to, mm -hmm. to now. Thank God, yes. I must say, in many yeah. ways. Um, but I, I guess nothing's ever stopped me from thinking I can do that. Um, and I, I do feel slightly... Symp sympathetic towards a younger generation because they can look up everything uh, they think they can't make a mistake and mistakes are the way that you really do learn yeah. <laughs> and also it's okay you know and I I you don't have to know everything all the time and you don't have to have a plan from when you're 21 you know, we always say, my husband and I, we still don't know what we want to do. You know? <laughs> but it's, um, you know, get on a path to your point. Get on a path, try it out. Nothing has to be forever anyway. Mm. And see where it leads you, you know. That's what I'm doing almost with the company now. I've, I've you know, and the path becomes a little bit, um, you know, it's it's changed since COVID. That, that path has changed again, um, and you have to go. Okay, well, okay, I have to let go of that and have to move in this in this direction. Mm. So I like I like that journey of of life really in mm. a way. It's like beginner's mind. So you're so always would, yeah you're always in that sense of you know newness and learning and driving. I guess that mm. probably drives everybody crazy in my in my life but um you know I'm just I want things organized and good and um I guess that's been a challenge with the startup as well because everything can't be as you want it to be from day one yeah so that's been a big lesson mm. looking back at mm. your younger self mm. what advice would you give yourself um tomorrow's a new day don't get so stressed about that thing that is today that could last for you know a week in my head that mm. I was you know tomorrow is a new day um, 
is what I would sort of tell myself, I think. That's a great piece of advice. It's, um, we could get so stuck on things, can't we? Mm-hmm. And that's something I know that is the one thing that really bothers me is when something negative happens and I can just get super fixated about that. And it's taken me a lot of time, many years, to figure out how to unlearn that and not to be so attached to that negative outcome and um, in Russian there is a saying um, which is uh, which means like the morning is wiser than the night so as in like sleep on it you know this idea of like you don't have to resolve everything like on the night when you're like in the thick of it like you need that sleep that pause to figure out and think of a new solution and um, yeah, I, I de- love that statement because it's, it's yeah. something we do in, in the company, actually. If we can't make a decision, I said, let's sleep on it. Yeah. And, and also don't think about it because mm-hmm. the next day yeah. you will have some clarity. Mm-hmm. It's very hard to let go of negative things that happen and to mm-hmm. dwell. And it, I do it all the time still. But mm-hmm. I think tomorrow is another day, mm-hmm. you know, and I think in our modern lives, we we get so caught up you know in that in things being right that you 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 know the perfectionist trap yes yeah and the not failing trap yes yeah what's failure i I don't don't, it just doesn't go the way that you think it will go yeah and what's next for you especially with floral street um you know for the first time in my life i am in the in the moment we are being the best we can be and we are building and building. And I haven't got a, uh, an end game. I just think we're just really start. People are really starting to know us. I'm really, really loving that people are saying, oh, I love Floral Street. I'm recognizing the brand. Um, and I want that to grow. And I want the team to be able to grow. And I, I want us to be you know, a significant British brand Mm. that I'm very proud of. And the one thing that I do consistently want to strive for is better sustainability in everything we do, genuinely. Um, You know, people have got to give up, you know, single-use plastic bottles. I don't know why we just aren't banning them. Mm -hmm. You you go to Asia and they're floating in the sea and, you know, it's... upsets me so I think if I wasn't doing this I'd become one of those hardcore eco warriors move over Greta Thunberg but Mm. you know I'm you have to be measured in life my experiences taught me and make changes along the way Mm. Um, so I think it's just now enjoy enjoy where we've got to from zero to where we are today Um, really establish Floral Street as this really strong great British brand that I'm proud of in the beauty industry and it's an industry that's given me a whole career and so many other people Um, and you know I've got huge gratitude to that as well. Well I wish you all the best and I can't wait to try the products and um, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you Michelle. You've been listening to Anatomy of a Leader podcast. I'm your host, Maria Vorostovsky. If you haven't already, please follow and subscribe this podcast and I'll see you in the next episode.